Thank you for joining us for Panel 1, Developing Economic Opportunities in BC's Coastal Communities. It's my pleasure to introduce this morning's speakers. My good friend Paul Correa, Senior Policy Advisor from Coastal First Nations, Mayor Gabby Wickstrom from the town of Port McNeil, and Kim Lefebvre, Manager of Indigenous Fibre Partnerships from Paper Excellence Canada. It's a tremendous honour to have all three of you on board today. Good morning, everybody. Morning. Morning, Dallas. Morning. How, how's, how's the wind doing in the North Island today? Still windy. <laughs> Still windy? <laughs> Pretty iffy up here. <laughs> well, we appreciate you making it on, and I'm glad that you got your backup plans ready. Should, should the power do what it tends to do on the North Island from time to time? Um, Paul, great to, great to see your picture. Um, thank you for being here today. Dallas, I'm wondering why it's only a picture, but I can't figure out technology, so. <laughs> well, Good to see you. I don't think we've ever hired you on to advise us on our technical issues, so. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to fill that part out on your resume. That's okay, my friend. My apologies. No worries at all. Glad to have you aboard. So here we are. Um, you know, we, we talk about this. You, you, you line people up for a conference, and then you say what it's going to be about. And then you kind of get to the moment and um, excited to get this going, but I know it's only going to last for so long, so I'm a little bit hesitant to start off, but um, I don't know what to say other than, okay, let's go. <laughs> Sounds good. So coastal opportunities is, is something that, you know, many of us, at least on this panel, have, have been talking about for a long time. I think of the Great Bear Rainforest, obviously, because that's the only job I've ever had is, is my time in the Great Bear Rainforest. And through that, I've just learned a wealth of what different people do up and down the coast and how that's changed over the years and the real stick to it of this is that a word well it is now um, i've used it live live on a program that it takes to roll with the punches a little bit you know when, when i grew up i used to commercial fish every summer and i got fired but people fished until you couldn't fish anymore and then you logged and just that time isn't there anymore and our communities have had to become a little bit more resilient to find opportunities as opposed to just taking advantage of the opportunities that our regional geography brings us into. So um, it's great to have you three on to just talk about some of the some of the things that are going on on the coast and some of the challenges and some of the opportunities that we have. So maybe we'll start off with, um, geez, what, I can't even remember the speaking order that we agreed to. I believe it was, Paul. yeah, Paul first. That's right. So Paul. <laughs> I should learn to open my notes or at least have my glasses on if I'm going to have my notes in front of me. This is kind of like the first day of school jitters right now with Auntie Sophie was there because I got to be prim and proper and I got to be, you know, well respectful. But um, you guys haven't known me since I was 12 years old. So <laughs> I'm not quite showing you the, the respect that I probably should. But Paul, um, you know, you and I have been working together for years on coastal opportunities. One of the things I was hoping you could highlight is um, some of the work that's been done around your fish chapter, your, your fisheries reconciliation that Coastal First Nations has worked a long time in negotiating and has just brought to fruition over the last three, four months. So maybe we'll open it up to you for some opening comments. Thanks. Thanks, Dallas. Uh, thanks, Kim, uh, Mayor Gabby, and all those attending. Uh, good morning. So I'm, I'm a senior policy advisor with Coastal First Nations. Um, uh, I'm a, a poor replacement for Christine Smith-Martin, our uh, CEO who wasn't available this morning. Um, I think all of you know that CFN is an alliance of eight First Nations. The uh, geography of British Columbia on the coast covered by the nations is huge. It's from northern Vancouver Island, Dallas's area, all the way up to the Alaska Panhandle, including Haida Gwaii. So these are the, the nations, and, and I'll repeat them because I think it's important to acknowledge that um, we're a not-for-profit society created and owned by these nations, the Okino, Helsa, Kitisu, Heihase, 
Gitgat, Metlakatla, Gitgatla, Old Masset, Skidigit, and the Council of the Haida Nations. Um, before I get into the fish agreement, I, I want to say that as a not-for-profit society, our, our mission is pretty simple. We, we are not the rights and title holder. We're an association. But our mission is fairly, fairly sharp. It's um, in, in, in a couple of senses of that word. It's to protect the environment, working regionally, working for these nations. Job one is to protect the environment, the regional environment. Job two is out of that, create a sustainable economy. And so examples of work that this organization has led is for, for right or for wrong, and some on, on this um, uh, event might disagree, but uh, the nations have been fierce in fighting the oil pipeline, the Enbridge oil pipeline, and are quite proud that it, is, uh, it didn't come through. In a positive vein, they've continued that up with uh, the oil tanker ban, and they're, again, fiercely proud that Bill C-48, which was quite a battle through the Senate, and we spent a lot of time in Ottawa working the corridors to get a very close vote to get that through. That's fulfilling that first mission. you got to protect the environment before you can do anything. Now let's drop into creating that sustainable economic development. Um, just this past summer, uh, the nations uh, signed an agreement with Canada. It's, it's probably the largest reconciliation agreement to date that Canada will have entered into. Um, it's, it's built upon the fact that these nations have very strong, or they have, rights and title. If that weren't so, Canada would not have sat and, and signed this agreement. Having said that, the nations have given away nothing. This is not a treaty. The minister has uh, you know, the rights that are uh, there for Canada, and so the minister is not fettered. Uh, having said that, the nations are not fettered either. And so this, we can get into the details, but it's like a parallel um, uh, process. And the strength of it is collaborative governance. And um, all species are going to be covered. There'll be a, sh a schedule of time, you know, over the next 10, 12 years. Every species, dive fisheries, pelagics, all of them are covered. Uh, what it gives under the co co collaborative management approach is that First Nations bilater bilaterally will sit with DFO and come up with the integrated fish management plans. All of them will be jointly created. Again, not right from day one for all of them. There is a schedule of species, but that's the power of this. So the, the nations will be creating a new company and uh, will compete, participate in the broader commercial fishery. But the really exciting part of this will be a new community-based fishery which will emerge. Where once fisheries provided tremendous wealth and income to the nations and it disappeared, there are no longer the small artisanal fleets that used to exist in each of the nations, we're going to recreate that. And uh, these fisheries will permit family groups to be on the water, to fish for food, and to fish for an economic livelihood. So there'll be two types of fisheries, the broader commercial one and this new community-based fishery, which will also have the ability to sell into the marketplace. That's it in a nutshell. It's, it's going to be an exciting time. Uh, we have um, uh, uh, the, the initial board of directors that have been appointed to create the main holding company and out of that will be a commercial fishing company that will be established and then a structure for the community-based fisheries. I want to maybe end by saying the fisheries will no longer uh, ever be what it was. You know, it, as I mentioned the tremendous wealth that was produced. By design, it is not going to be uh, prosecuted the way it was. The, the whole point of this is that conservation-based ethic that has driven coastal First Nations will carry through into the, the fisheries here. Having said that then, there are going to be jobs and revenue gaps. Forestry is not what it was by design. Tourism by design is not going to be massive busloads or, or boats of people. And so there's going to be a question about where will the jobs and the revenue come from in an area that's pretty well challenged with, with jobs. And I think there we can get into a discussion on what the opportunity perhaps with clean and renewable energy might be. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Dallas. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Paul. Really looking forward into into getting some of this through some through some questions and some dialogue. Um, Gabby, you still got power. That's awesome. Um, please, you know, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, Gaila Kessler, Nuguam, Gabby Wickstrom. 
So good morning, everybody. I'm joining you today from Port McNeil on the North Island, which is in the traditional territory of the Kwakwakiwak. It's a pleasure and an honor to have been invited to be part of this conference, and I'm looking forward to the upcoming sessions. From a municipal lens, there are a couple of areas I want to highlight today. The first one is our North Island Community Forest Limited Partnership, which is also known as NICFLIP. Well over 10 years ago, our community forest was formed, and it consisted of three municipalities, Port Alice, Port Hardy, and Port McNeil. Over the years, NICFLA has been quite successful and has seen over a million dollars flow to each of the communities. But here's the problem. Our forest tenure is located in the traditional territories of the Quatsino and Quagulith First Nations, and they are currently not part of this partnership. During our prep for this session, Dallas, Dallas mentioned that there's a need to talk about our past mistakes, and this is one of them. I'm very proud to say that when the Board of Directors approached us to extend an invitation to both nations to become equity share partners, all our councils wholeheartedly supported this. Why? Because it's the right thing to do. What NICFLIP can offer is a structure that's been successful and ready to go, which is important because our local First Nations struggle with capacity. We want to be an example of reconciliation, of righting wrongs, and we want to see all our communities thrive. This is what makes community forests so wonderful. And there is, as there is local input as to how the, to manage the land, and we want to do so in a responsible way. The second area I'd like to talk about is advocacy. And I have two brief examples. Because I'm on the executive of UBCM, I see this as a natural area for local governments to be involved in and where we can really help each other. For the last two years, we've had power outages in our region like nothing we've ever experienced. They are often full day or multiple day interruptions. And as a region, we feel as though we're being forgotten because we're rural and we're remote. Since there is strength in numbers, Port Hardy Mayor Dennis Dugas organized a meeting of the minds to discuss the VC Hydro issues and possible solutions. It is so exciting to see us all at the table, Port Hardy, Port McNeil, Port Alice, the regional district, Alert Bay, Namgis, Quatsino, Quagulith, and the Guasalanaquada. All of us share a common vision to have safe, prosperous communities with the quality of service we deserve. I'm confident because we're brainstorming together, we will all be able to solve the issues that affect us and it affects our quality of life, health and economics for all of our residents and our businesses. My second example is about a dynamic woman named Lucy Sager. She owns All Nations Driving School. And because I used to own a driving school, Lucy floated her discussion paper my way called Road to, Reconcili Re Road to Reconciliation, which has been endorsed by the Union of BC Chiefs. It has been determined that one of the greatest barriers to employment for Indigenous people is a lack of driver's license. You can have all the training programs in the world, but if someone can't get themselves to a job site, it's useless. In her discussion paper, she lists 15 truth and reconciliation calls to action that can be addressed through access to a license and gives 40 recommendations as to how it can be done. Many of the recommendations are low cost solution and for the life of me, I can't figure out why they've not been implemented. So I've made it my mission to tell as many people as I can in my sphere of influence of Lucy's work as the provincial government needs to recognize that equity cannot be attained until this issue is resolved. So I'll end with this. I'm not always going to get things right, and we may not always agree, but my dear friend Lillian Hunt used to tell me to be honest, ask for forgiveness, and be open to learn. I have taken this advice to heart, and it is always at the forefront of any conversation I have with Indigenous people. Thank you so much for allowing me to share, and I welcome the questions to come. Thanks so much, Gabby. Some great points around there. And um, before I go to, to Kim, just the evolution of leadership on the North Island from strong leaders for their communities to strong leadership for their region has just been wonderful to see as someone who's kind of had a front row seat to watch that evolution. So good on you. Kim, um, Paper Excellence, Atlee, all kinds of wonderful things going on. So please, why don't you give us some opening comments? Yeah, thanks a lot, Dallas. Um, I'll just introduce myself and the company. Um, my name is Kim, Kim LaFave. I'm calling in from the unceded traditional territory of the Kwakwakiwak on northern Vancouver Island in Port McNeil, same as Gabby. We've got a great mayor. <laughs> uh, I'm the manager of Indigenous Fibre Partnerships at Paper Excellence, and I'm also a professional forester. I've got experience living and working in remote communities across BC. 
Um, in my role with Paper Excellence, I'm focused on developing relationships with Indigenous communities and advancing economic reconciliation by investing in new business opportunities that are mutually beneficial. I also work with a fairly large team internally to maintain our progressive Aboriginal relations certification and our world-class FSC chain of custody environmental certification, which are some pretty high standards to maintain and something we're really proud of. Uh, a little background about Paper Excellence. Um, we're a pulp and paper company and we were founded in 2007. That's about 15 years ago. Uh, by 2011, Paper Excellence had acquired five pulp and paper mills across Canada and then in 2019 acquired the Catalyst Mills, which some of you on coastal BC might be more familiar with. Uh, so it's a pretty young company considering the age and legacy of the mills that they've taken on, uh, on that have been on the coast since the early 1900s. So, And uh, there's about 3,000 people employed by Paper Excellence. Uh, over the past couple of years, Paper Excellence has really turned their attention towards Indigenous reconciliation and has committed to starting down that path in a meaningful way. Um, we recognize that the way of the future in Canada is to work together with Indigenous communities so all of us can prosper moving forward. Um, forming business partnerships is a great way to establish a long-term relationship because uh, both parties are invested in each other and we want to see long-term stability and predictability for our employees and for our business partners. Uh, it also reflects our commitment to Section 92 of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 94 Calls to Action. And uh, a great example is our recent partnership with Numbies First Nation on the Atlee Chip Plant near Port McNeil. And that's something that Dallas mentioned and you might have read about in the news this year. Um, I just want to say that I'm not the only Paper Excellence uh, employee working on our Indigenous program. Um, my focus is specific to business partnerships, um, but we also have Lana Wilhelm, who's our manager of community and Indigenous relations, who's leading a lot of our other initiatives like relationship agreements with our mill sites, you know, uh, Indigenous scholarships and donations, uh, our progressive Aboriginal relations certification, and even supporting Indigenous language revitalization, like our recent renaming of the Powell River Mill. So uh, there's also teams of people in communications and fiber supply, our PAR steering committee, legal sales and others. So uh, I'm just trying to say that it takes more than one person to really accomplish a meaningful impact in a company. And we've really put a lot of effort throughout the organization to starting to build an Indigenous program that's robust and sustainable for the long term. So anyways, I don't want to take up too much time, but I did want to say thank you to Dallas and the IROC organizers for having me here. And I really appreciate the opportunity to speak on this panel. And uh, I'm looking forward to sharing more about our recent work and hearing more about uh, these inspiring panelists sitting next to me. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much, everybody. Um... You know, where do you go with these things? The coast is a big place. There's lots of opportunity, but maybe to pick up on some of the things Paul was talking about is it's really hard to develop something if you haven't protected what's important first. Um, you know, we, we've been through various land use planning processes, whether it be the core process in the 90s, which had its flaws, to the Great Bear Rainforest process of the 2000s, which had some flaws, but they all brought opportunity and they all brought people together to talk about what was important to them. And as people have those dialogues and discussions, they find common denominators that make it able to progress and go forward. But so, Paul, um, you know, I, I know that the YCFN was brought together. I still remember the day in Vancouver when, you know, Gujao, Art Starrett, Gary Waters, and David Suzuki walked in the room and declared the day of the Coastal First Nations and the Turning Point Initiative. And while your mandate has always been about protection and you've helped work with your communities to protect upwards of 70% of some of their territories, how do you find that balance? You know, because as you said, there, there's an economy that we used to depend on that isn't as strong as it was. So how, how do you guys try to find some of that balance in there? Thanks, Dallas. That's, um, that's an excellent question. And I have to say that... Um, in each of the nations, that 
dialogue is a robust one because you can imagine that there is um, uh, an elected uh, government and it, it changes um, and so th those become the, the topics that are first and foremost in, in many of those election battles. On top of it, you've got uh, um, traditional and hereditary leaders and that um, structure exists and so there's, there's quite a robust dialogue on um, uh, how this should proceed and, and I think um, I'm giving away nothing by saying that we have nations that um, are quite active in the, um, the salmon farming industry and yet we have neighbors who uh, would, would not participate in that sector. Uh, we have uh, in, in our membership, we have nations that are and have signed agreements with uh, uh, LNG companies and others who have protested against uh, the development and shipping of LNG. Uh, those are pretty stark, difficult kinds of topics and they recur and occur in each of the nations. And so the short answer is that that dialogue is, uh, I don't want to say daily, but is a constant discussion point. Uh, there's there's not a simple formula or an easy answer, and it requires, I think, Sophie kicking off the discussion and you reinforcing it, Dallas, it requires a constant relationship dialogue within the nations and then between the nations as neighbors. Yeah, thanks, Paul. That That's great. Um, you know, one of the things I've always marveled about Coastal First Nations, for those who don't know, Coastal First Nations and Nunmacolas have a very a symbiotic relationship. We, we work together behind the scenes on a lot of issues, but it, it's tremendous to watch what happens when we know what we want. Um, you know, can you just, some comments on, on enforcing how important it is when, we, when we're all on the same page, how much easier it is to deal with local governments, federal governments, provincial governments, there's a certain strength there that we don't tap into enough from my perspective, but because of the challenges of the issues and the wants and needs of nations up and down the coast, it's a tough thing to do, but maybe just a little insight on, on that balance of knowing what we want and how to get it. Yeah, um, there are matters that are very much uh, nation driven and the Coastal First Nations organization doesn't intrude on those and so you know we're not involved in housing or uh, other programs that are community-based. Similarly on um, even resource matters there are those that are very much within the purview of the nations but the strength of working together uh, I, I have to say um, in, in negotiations with the Government of Canada in particular uh, DFO they were clear that you know we wouldn't have sat at the table and signed the agreement we have if there wasn't this regional focus you can't do fish management for a number of these species without strong linkage uh, on, a, on a biophysical level the, the region makes sense and um, I think the nations who have been very individualistic and are very strong that way find by working together through CFN their creation um, uh, as that vehicle to to bring that regional focus uh, and I think there are other subjects that we're going to have to tackle on a broader focus and we can get into some of the impacts of a changing climate and the need to to mitigate and then more importantly adapt and some of that stuff well has a, a very local uh, impact in terms of mitigating and solutions probably has a, a greater regional kind of consideration so it's, a, it's an interesting dialogue within communities and then between communities and with neighbors and partners, including local government and industry. Thanks, Paul. And so anybody who has questions, please feel free to, to use the app and put them up there. But, you know, I can go all day with these people. So if you don't, that's OK, too. I say that a little bit tongue in cheek. Um, Mayor Wickstrom, um, you know, that's a good segue into collaboration and support. Like I sort of alluded to after your opening comments, I was around in the early days when I won't say which mayors from which of the three towns would say to me, you know, you're okay for one of them. Oh. To a point where we have this collaboration now and I think of things like Island Coast Economic Trust where we've had to come together with resources but minimal resources so we've had to make the best opportunity that we can with them. I look at the hospital that ended up in Alert Bay and the regional collaboration that it took 
for that to happen and then for you to talk about um, Mayor Dugas and his, you know, kind of solutions table approach to some of the things that, you know, anyone else in an urban environment would just take for granted. Maybe some comments on just, you know, and I don't want to say it's a new evolution, but th this era where there's a lot more collaboration between Indigenous communities and regional governments. What's, what's some of your thoughts on that? Well, it's ridiculous to think that we can accomplish things all on her, our own. Um, I know that uh, if I use, for example, uh, FCM, uh, there, there was a, um, a leader once who said they didn't understand. Uh, we were just little fish in a big pond. Why would we want to be involved with the federal Canadian municipalities? And I said, yeah, but when we all group together, we can look like a bigger fish. And uh, so I think of things it just makes sense. So we have a doctor's crisis right now in Port McNeil, but it's not just Port McNeil residents who use the the health, the doctor clinic, and it affects the hospital. It affects people from Alert Bay. It affects people from, from WAS, Zabalis, all over. And so we are trying to, um, to rectify that problem, to, to attract people, to work together. We're working with the Numgis very closely on that. Um, and they're reaching out to their First Nations connections that I maybe don't have. And just really adding or amplifying the voice and saying that we're not going to settle for second class, class healthcare. We want to be a model for healthcare in the region that can be emulated in, in other rural communities. And the only way that we can do that is if we all work together on it. No, that, that, that's tremendous. I, I think of some of the issues that we've had to, to deal with over the time. The WFP strike hurt us regionally very hard and we had to, you know, come together. I know you and I exchanged a lot of text messages and, and calls leading up to the rally um, just to bring some attention to the matter. And so, Kim, um, you know, I first met Paper Excellence in my Great Bear Rainforest days when they came in and started acquiring some assets within within the plan area or within the adjacent plan area. What do you think the role of industry is? And, you know, I don't want you to speak for industry as a whole. Obviously, you wouldn't do that. But, you know, what what is Paper Excellence's thoughts on where industry can come in and support both, you know, Indigenous and, and regional communities? Yeah, well, I mean we say the term economic reconciliation a lot. And I think that, um, you know, you really got to believe in that, uh, you know, being a, a big um, industry player, you know, you have a lot of ability to form new partnerships and work together with different communities. Uh, we're trying to ensure that our staff are starting to learn about Indigenous history. And we've seen a lot of that this year, uh, just a need for understanding the past and, and where everyone's coming from so that we can uh, have some empathy and some compassion and, and move forward in a different way, in a better way than we have in the past. And uh, industry is, uh, you know, a key utilizer of our resources in BC and and that means for Indigenous communities to get involved they they often have to work together with industry to to be a part of that so um, we have a real responsibility to reach out and that's what my role is all about I just started at this company a year ago so I'm just uh, in the process of reaching out and trying to form new relationships and and think about business partnerships and be creative and and come to the table with um, you know uh, an approach that's including an equity position in businesses and and committing to long term relationships, which is really important. So um, yeah, I think that's really what uh, what we're trying to do. And something you know you mentioned the Atlee partnership. Um, we came to the table and and purchased an equity stake and, and industry needs to be comfortable with maybe not being uh, the, the majority partner in these relationships. We came into that relationship with a 15% ownership stake and that was really difficult and different for us to, to not have that sort of ownership control and, and Atlee Resources had 60% ownership. So it's really, um, it's able to the company is able to meet the the 
Numgi's First Nations um, goals in terms of, uh, you know, economic development for the community and also employment opportunities for their members and uh, lots of things like that. So um, we need to be here to support. And sometimes it doesn't mean we're we're in complete control, which is it's OK. Like the relationship is great and we're we have a seat at the table and we're working together really well. So uh, don't be afraid of it. That's all. That's a great message because over the years I've learned as, as you deal with senior levels of both provincial and federal governments, as First Nations, you kind of go in with solutions and they always like, well, what does industry think? And what does local communities think? And, you know, it's really important for us to take this regional look at these issues so we can find where our common denominators are and not allow the governments of the day to stifle the energies that we bring when we collaborate. So th this is really tremendous stuff. Um, I see I got some questions coming up on the board now. Um, so Paul, um, <laughs> I'm sure you're gonna be happy to answer this one. Um, when, you, when you have topics, uh, as you mentioned, with some nations supporting development, some other nations not supporting development, um, you know, what advice do you share, do you share, do you have to share with the group? I, I go back to the relationship. Um response. Uh, it, it may not happen on the timing or the schedule that uh, you, a company or a developer might want, but um, uh, you've got to be patient and build that relationship. It, I, I think going around the backs or trying to lever from a, another perspective isn't necessarily the way that's going to do it. Create the relationship, establish the relationship, be prepared for a no, be prepared for a no but, a no maybe, uh, a no with conditions. Uh, or a yes with conditions, um, I, th I think it's to be there for the long term because that's what the nations will look to see for um, on, on this, the relationship long term. That's tremendous. I'm flashing back to something that, you know, we can giggle about now, but when we signed the fishery or the reconciliation framework agreement in Prince Rupert with the with the chiefs yes. from Namakolas and, and Coastal First Nations, and right up till midnight the morning, the night before, um, we weren't on the same page, and we were literally getting calls from the prime minister's office saying, "Well, the plane's on its way. If you guys don't have agreement, he's not going to land." And it was, you know, having that patience, like you talked about, to make sure that we we're able to talk with the chiefs one on one, and then collectively, just with that flexibility of knowing that we're going to get through it. Everybody might not be overjoyed, but we had the relationships in place where we knew that we could continue to talk regardless of what side the coin landed on. So um, I guess today I can say we can laugh at that, but maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I recall those days. Guys. Yeah. So um, next question I got is um, how have First Nations pivoted relative to the closure of commercial salmon fisheries regardless of the type and harvest methods? Um, that, you know, that's obviously a bit of a loaded question, but I think you're starting to see First Nations not let the almighty dollar be the determining factor on a lot of these issues anymore. I think you're starting to see some communities not forego sustenance rights, but forego economic opportunities because stocks are in decline. I, th I think of um, my friend William Housty up in Bella Bella, who's always making sure, you know, everybody's playing by the, by the rules that need to be played by from a conservation first point of view. Um, maybe Paul, do you have a couple quick, couple quick insights on just what First Nations are doing around some of these issues? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, we, we are, uh, through the nations, uh, active in, uh, in um, um, coming up with solutions and so we are underway with restoring six of the hatcheries in our nations I mean that's not a full solution but boy we're spending time and money um, we're doing the creek walking and the checking of the streams and that that never used to be done or hasn't been done in the last little while we even are participating with some major ocean research for those of you who know what through the Pacific Salmon Foundation and uh, Dr. Riddle and Beamish are doing, you know, we, the CFN, have put some money in to say, we need to have a part of this. We need to know what's going on in the North Pacific with the changing climate. We need to develop models that work better than the models that are there now in terms of returns and that. So research being right there on the waters and streams and 
then uh, working with the nations to say we've got to stop harvesting until we figure out what's going on or restrict the harvesting to to elders and providing for their foods and that so there's a comprehensive response that uh, the nations are are putting forward in terms of the salmon crisis tremendous um mir wickstrom you know we've been around the north island a long time and i can think of the days when there is you know 75 80 saners in alert bay um you know a dozen maybe or so in port mcneil port hardy had them we just don't have that that strength of job creation anymore you think each sane boat employs six people directly not counting the rest what are some of the things port mcneil's doing to help offset just that lack of economic activity moving around some of the community gosh um that's a difficult one to answer i i don't think we've we've really come to a solution um I think the, the hardest parts are, are some of the federal regulations that have been coming, um, you know, with to do with um, uh, shrimp uh, operators, to do with, um, you know, the, the licenses uh, for commercial fishing. And, and there's these arbitrary, it seems, policies that are being made coming from the federal government with, it sounds like, little consultation with First Nations or um, non-Indigenous. And so it's it's really difficult. But for, for, we were just doing our official community plan. And I, I think what we're looking at is diversification. So that means, you know, we're not looking for that 100, 200, 300 um, employer. We're looking for the, you know, 10, 50s, whatever that is, whether it's um, tourism or um, a coffee company, <laughs> such as Kicking Horse Coffee. Uh, things like that, just something that's different where the owners are making maybe looking for a quality of life that we can offer and uh, that they can't find elsewhere um, and is more affordable to to uh, to live and um, just look at our community instead of looking at the city. That's tremendous. And I, I think back to our time on Ice Tea together where that was kind of the goal is how can we help these create these communities become sustainable and use that quality of life that the coast of BC has to offer, um, which leads into uh, the next question that I see here. You know, what would three changes coming down the economic pipeline that the panel would see as crucial in advancing points that they have touched on today? Maybe Kim, um, you talked about paper excellence, taking that leap of faith and not being the majority owner of the new enterprise that you're in, but it's still working. Maybe just some comments or comments around that with, with regards to the question would, would be great. Yeah, sure. Um, I don't know if I have specifically three, but uh, changes are happening every day. I mean, we've got we're in a political environment where legislation is changing. Um, you know, I was chatting with uh, the other partners in Atlee yesterday, and we were saying, you know, we started the the negotiations and the business uh, plan and everything based on a certain set of legislation and. Um, you know, with that opportunity, it was with uh, salvage from the fiber recovery zones. And then recently the, the government postponed the, the penalty, the waste penalties for that. So it kind of, uh, it could Im impact that business. So things change while, while you're doing things and you've got to adapt. And I mean, we're still working on salvage and we're, we're optimistic that they're going to put the penalties back in place, but, um, you know, they might not. And that's something that we just need to adapt to. Uh, COVID is a tough one. I mean, we thought we might be done with it by now, but we're not. And that adds its own challenges, um, you know, to forming relationships. And uh, I'll tell you, it's pretty tough to have those um, uncomfortable conversations and wade into the, the difficult stuff when you're on a phone or you're trying to do emails or you're uh, calling in by video, it's just not the same as in person. And, and this really adds to the dynamic of building relationships. So um, yeah, that's pretty important. Um, yeah, I mean, the old growth uh, situation in the province is another one. I mean, we've, we've got so many things that we need to deal with, but um, I think that the industry is resilient and we're creative and, and we're able to come up with solutions together. 
you know, you, you got to trust your partners to, to try and come up with ways to be successful. Um, you know, things like uh, what you're talking about with Gabby there, um, having businesses be impacted and what you do to, to build new business. Well, you can also bolster current businesses and try and make them more successful than they have been. So uh, that's something that I've seen with the with the Atlee Chip Partnership. Um, if people aren't familiar with that partnership, it's a it's a chipping facility on the North Island and uh, it connects the the fiber supply to the chipper to the end user, which is paid for excellence. We use the chips to make pulp and paper. So um, our partners are, are Nambi's First Nation and also Wakash Contracting, who uh, who are active on the land base and doing salvage operations and running the chipper and having that connectedness and and uh, commitment to each other and and having the end user be invested in, in the people that are, uh, that are producing the product is, is pretty interesting and pretty critical, I think, for um, making businesses su successful in the long term. So there's a lot of things we can do, but um, it is a changing environment and we just have to adapt and uh, communicate a lot. <laughs> That, that's great. And I think, you know, that's a common, common message we're going to hear is, is communicating and communicating at the right levels where, you know, technical people are talking about technical things, bureaucratic people are talking about what the technical people agree on. And then we need to go to the decision makers with solutions. And the more that we can do that with industry, with local government, with First Nations on the issues that affect us all, I think we're going to have a lot more room for, for progress. Um, maybe the same question, but I'll segment it just a little bit differently for you, Gabby. Um, you know, you play a role at UBCM. If you could, if you could be dictator for a day, what's one piece of policy or something that you would change that would help put both remote rural communities and First Nations communities into a better position to um, diversify economies and maintain some of the limited economies that we seem to be losing a bit of hold on? Dictator for a day. Can a dictator be collaborative? I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I think it's really important. Uh, that there is a mechanism in place for the communities on the ground and the First Nations in the region to be to get together. I think the current structure really does pit one against the other, and I and I really don't like that. I think that um, there there really does need to be a place where First Nations municipalities, those that are in the region and on the ground, are able to get together. Um, so that we can have a collaborative mindset. I, I believe that we always will because, you know, our our residents are the ones that are going to be living it out on the ground of all these policy changes. No matter where we sit on the spectrum, whether it's old growth or aquaculture, we all have shared visions. Um, we need to have an open dialogue. As Kim said, it's a little difficult right now to have the hard conversations uh, with COVID, uh, but we have to get to the place where we can walk away being a little bit uncomfortable, but able to live with um, whatever policy changes those are. So if I was a dictator for a day, I would just say that there would be a strong mechanism in place for um, regionally, for First Nations and municipalities and regional districts to get together to, to be able to have input and to really hear from one another as to what those policy changes are going to, to do. No, that, that, that's tremendous. And I'm so glad that voices like yours are being heard at the UBCM executive, because as you say, if you just read about this in the press or social media, it's always an us versus them thing. And people don't see that connectivity of goods and services that are created in our communities do have an impact on the daily lives of urbanites and things like that. And so I, I'm really, I, I really feel better as I've gotten to know more about local government just seeing that there's people like yourself and I think of our good friend Carl on council down in um, Saanich and other places like that who actually reach out to Indigenous communities and ask us what we think about some of these issues now. So it's not just, well, I think I know what they think. I think I know what they want. We actually create those dialogues and have those opportunities to have those discussions. Um, Paul, you know, you and I have been working on this together. I know you spent a majority of, of your professional career 
um, advocating for both First Nations, salmon, all those sorts of things. Gone are the days where we're going to fish six days a week commercially and, you know, Sunday till Friday sort of stuff. What do you see as a, as a good steps in diversifying our economies? Carbon credits has sort of opened up some doors for us, but as you and I have learned, that's not going to solve the problems our communities face when it comes to the economic diversification that's needed. So what are some of your thoughts on, you know, sustainable economic diversification? Oh, I love the question. Thanks, Dallas. And by the way, for uh, people on the call, uh, you should know that with Nanamakola's uh, Council Nations and CFN, we are the largest um, um, sellers of uh, forest-based carbon offsets in Canada. And we have carbon offsets we can sell to you, the highest quality that you'll find in the world. So give us a call if you need carbon offsets in your portfolio for carbon management. Um, I, I think, uh, and I'm a, uh, been been kind of promoting this for some time with not many people listening maybe, but um, in our province, uh, electricity, power generation has been used for a long time as a tool for regional economic development. We see it in the southeast, Sophie's area, to the detriment of, of First Nations people where they have no salmon anymore, up in the northeast where there's been the court, court, recent court cases like the blueberry in that, uh, where Site C dominates. Why not take a positive approach and say, let's have a Northern Power Authority or Coastal Power Authority and use the, the need for economic development and electricity generation to come together with First Nations and rural British Columbians involved. We have a model in the Columbia Basin Power Authority and the Columbia Basin Trust. We could create a, a, a separate crown that would work in tandem with BC Hydro, but the control would be through local people, First Nations and non-First Nations people, and it would be a corporation to buy and sell power, and it would be for export. We would use the firming, firming and shaping power of the BC Hydro system to firm and shape all kinds of renewables that would be for the marketplace eastwards in Canada and southwards to the U.S. Let's, let's have the jobs at home. Right now, BC Hydro is selling firming and shaping to the U.S., for wind farms in Montana and Texas and places like that, or solar in California, but not in BC. So that's my pitch. Let's use electricity that's going to be in hot demand, and we've got lots of it, the potential for it in BC. Let's use it for an export product and involve and engage lots of people in that industry. What do you think? Uh, tremendous, tremendous. I think I think you got some support at support at this level for sure. Um, you know that that's some great insight. I think of when the LNG discussions were first starting, and we were talking about saying, okay, well, if you're going to open up this plant, it's got to run on clean energy from from the coast. And I can think of the three power projects right now up and down from my territories up into CFN's, CFN's members' territories that, that was gonna have the power line. And um, I think there's some definite opportunity around some of those issues. So I hope any of our friends from BC Hydro on the line are listening and can give um, their uppers a little bit of a briefing note that we're coming. And I got the mayor, I got Paul Correa, I got Kim LaFave, and we're ready. <laughs> um, Fun, final final comment, you know, it, it's always nice to get into these panels and I could sit and talk with you guys all day because we all live and breathe the same thing from the same area. But um, if, if you had kind of one one parting comment that you'd like our our viewers to to go home with, um, what would it what would it be? And this time we'll start with Kim. Uh, well, thank you again, Dallas, and uh, all the organizers for having me here and giving me the opportunity to meet these panelists. Uh, that was really great to hear all the different work that they're doing. Um, I also appreciate the opportunity to get our voice out there and let people know that Paper Excellence is committed to being a good business partner over the long term. Uh, we're looking for more opportunities that can support our pulp and paper operations and also contribute to the long-term success of Indigenous partners and their communities. Um, we're working in a changing p political landscape and we want to be sure that we're operating and providing good jobs and good products well into the future. Um, best way to ensure that is to do it in partnership with Indigenous communities. So thank you so much and this has been a great panel. Thanks so much, Kim. Great messaging. 
Mayor Wickstrom, um, I, I, I won't campaign for you because, as you know, I've, I've run in three elections and I'm 0-3, so I won't go into <laughs> promoting your upcoming upcoming personal plans, but parting shot. Upcoming personal plans. I don't have any upcoming personal plans. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to say once again how thankful I am to have been invited to take part today. Um, there's still a lot of work to do, but I'm really confident if we keep our community members at the forefront, we can accomplish a lot because we have many of the shared, same shared values. Um, and I was just thinking of what Elder Sophie Pierre said, uh, that'll occur when we listen to one another with open ears and open heart and with respect. So thank you very much for today. I appreciated being a part of this panel. Gaelic Asla, thanks so much, Gabby. Really appreciate you giving us your time today. Paul, final word. This isn't. This is usually the opposite, where I'm batting clean up and you're trying to get us out the door. But I'll try get us out the door and ask you to have the final thought for today's session. Thank you, Dallas, and thank you, uh, Kim and, and Mayor Gabby. Um, I, I think more of this kind of dialogue is 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 important and needed. Um, my final thoughts would be as tough and difficult a conversation as it can be for a forum like this, the recognition that there are uh, rights and title that the nations have is the core. We've got to recognize that societally, government to government and so forth. And from that then springs the ability to do other things, partnerships and, and development. First Nation communities needs jobs and the same kinds of needs that I think we've heard here in terms of revenue and so forth. But that recognition begins first with that the core that rights and title are there and we can go from there. Um, so that's my final thought, recognition of those rights and titles in a practical way. Thank you so much, um, speakers. Thank you all for joining us. I just want to say how wonderful it is to have an Indigenous Resource Opportunities Conference where we have the comfort of having three non-First Nations people give very valuable insight. And that's the evolution that we're talking about is we can all talk about these issues because they affect us all at the end of the day. And the fact that we're growing champions for the regions, um, we're all just gonna be in a better place. So I wanna thank you all for giving your time and energy today um, in this first panel discussion. So we're now scheduled for a 15 minute coffee break and we look forward to greeting you back at 10.35 a.m. Pacific time for panel two establishing contracting and business opportunities. Over the break, we encourage you to take a moment to visit our sponsors in the Sponsors Hall and the Trade Show. And for those of you who aren't following me yet on Twitter, Dallas4BC, if I get up 50 extra followers from today's session, we'll really have some fun with the question and answer period with the ministers we have on Slate tomorrow. So let's have a coffee break and come back in a bit. Thank you very much. <laughs>